morning stand here. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Good crowd. Um, you know, so I want to talk about the impacts, the, the things we can learn from Second Life. And let's, do, let's just do a little check. How many people like know what Second Life is? A lot of people. Wonderful. A friendly crowd, so you all know it. What I thought I might do is talk about, what, what, what I'm going to do is talk about quickly about the impact of Second Life, what we've learned from it, and what virtual worlds more generally can tell us about governance, uh, about economics, about social media, and especially for an event like this, think about, thinking about that in the context of what it can tell us about both the online world and also the real world. Um, and I'm just going to, you know, because Second Life is such a massive thing, there's just a bunch of pictures up there to kind of set the stage that I'll refer to a little bit, but what I thought I would do is just with the time is just first give you a few thoughts that are relevant and hopefully maybe provocative uh, and that might uh, give you something to think about to either ask a question or challenge me on. And I'll go through those things quickly and then we'll have some time um, for conversation. So let's do that. Um, the first thing to say about Second Life, because it's been a while, it's been around for 20 years, you know, who cares, right? It, I, I want to argue that it's big enough to matter. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just big enough to be important and relevant and statistically sort of confident for conversations like these about world building. There's about a million people in Second Life. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, Second Life has an even uh, balance of gender. It has a global uh, set of people that are using it. People using Second Life are dispersed around the world just about the same way the internet is as a whole. Um, there's lots of different ages. Second Life isn't just little kids, which unfortunately at this point most multiplayer virtual environments uh, are just little kids. So uh, Second Life uh, is almost entirely adults. Kids tend to avoid it. Um, and so it, it, it's big enough to matter in that way. It's also, as you can see in the kind of upper right there, uh, it's big. Second Life is a tiled network of about 20,000 server machines covering an area um, about the size of Los Angeles. So you have a million people living together in a single space where most, in, in many places, you can kind of walk from anywhere to anywhere. You know, you can start walking or riding a virtual motorcycle and get all the way across the world. And um, in that world, there are hundreds of millions of uh, digital objects that were created entirely by the people that live there. Um, they were, in many ways, the first of what we now call NFTs, in the sense that in Second Life, you can walk up to you know, the table in front of those people there and uh, click on it and see uh, who it belongs to, or it might belong to a group. I'll touch on that more later. You can uh, buy a copy of it for yourself if the owner set it that way. So a lot of these ideas that we had about digital objects and digital objects being transferable and, and whatnot um, were things that got pioneered in Second Life quite some time ago, starting in 2003. Um, let's talk about the economy. Second Life has its own currency, and I'm going to come back to that because that's a big part of what I'm working on nowadays. So Second Life from 2003 on had its own currency. And we encouraged people, unlike video games, we encouraged people to trade it against other currencies if they wanted to. And later we set up a whole currency exchange that allows people to do that uh, professionally, if you will. Uh, so Second Life has an enormous currency of its own. The, the, the GDP of Second Life, if you think about it as a, a city or a country, is about $700 million a year. That's what it is today, by the way. Uh, for those who haven't seen Second Life in a while, it's actually just the same size that it ever was. It got up to its peak size around 2008. We can talk about it later. I'm not going to talk about why it hasn't gotten bigger and why other virtual worlds haven't gotten bigger, but we can if you want. That's a big, in, or, or after this, that's a big important conversation as well. But um, So it's $700 million, a million people. About $80 million a year is taken out of the economy, which means that it provides jobs for several thousand people in the real world. So it's interesting in that regard as well. So it's a pretty good sweep of everything. Um, and that GDP is not speculation like crypto. 
that's people making and selling things to each other. The, there, there, again, I can talk about it more. There is no speculation uh, on the Second Life currency. And a fun thing for people here that are following crypto, many people, and people come up to me all the time at things like this and tell me this, um, many people got their first Bitcoin from an ATM in Second Life. Anybody here do that? Yes. So somebody, not us, not the company, but somebody, some clever entrepreneur, set up a vending machine, in, or many vending machines all over Second Life, where you could walk up to the vending machine. It's actually that little picture up there on the right in the middle. You could walk up to the vending machine and you could uh, put uh, Linden dollars in and get back, I guess, a public and a private key from the machine. So many people, and, and this was at the time when there were no, Mount Gox was yet to be built. So there were no ways to get Bitcoin other than become a Bitcoin miner. And so it was quite common that people got Bitcoin in Second Life. And so I think it's just so wonderfully weird that uh, we were there so long before that you know we set up these machines or somebody did. Um, that's kind of fun. Talking a little bit more about the economy. Um, the other weird thing about Second Life in comparison to crypto is that the, the currency in Second Life had to actually be a, and I'm going to use the words some of us know here, you know, different uses for money. The currency in Second Life needed to be a medium of exchange, that thing that presently crypto is not. Crypto is a store of value, the, typically the second thing people talk about money being for. But in Second Life, because we were trying to build a currency that, only, that had only one purpose, which was to enable people to optionally buy and sell stuff from each other they were making. Um, so we had, to gener we had to actually create a real currency, a currency like dollars or coins or whatever uh, in the real world. And so in doing that, we had to make very different design considerations. Uh, the currency had to remain stable in price, because unless you're a crazy crypto uh, utopian maximalist, uh, or you're an economist, you know that uh, currencies that are actually used to buy and sell things have to remain constant in price. Otherwise, you know, one of one of several very bad things happens. Um, so we had to keep the currency stable, which we did in a number of ways. And one of the ways we did that was we gave everybody, and we still do, a basic income. So this big conversation we're having as a society today around UBI and basic income actually started experimentally in some sense, or, or we started using it in Second Life a long time ago. We just gave people money in Second Life without any promise that that money could be turned into real dollars. We, we never, we still don't, uh, promised to buy or sell that money from people. Instead, we allowed them to trade with each other and to trade the money with each other. So when you buy Linda dollars in Second Life, you're actually buying them from somebody who chose to sell them to you, basically. So we're facilitating an exchange. So we had this basic income, and we had a stable price. Now, what does that mean? It means that the currency was not backed by scarcity, like everybody talks about. It wasn't even backed by gold, you know, like we hear about, you know, before 1971. Um, instead, it's simply, therefore, backed by people. Oh, and I, I should say, the price of the Second Life's currency has remained exactly the same, varying only a percentage point or two over, you know, like a, a week's time uh, for the last 20 years. People started trading Linden dollars with each other just for fun, experimentally, uh, 20 years ago, and they ended up paying about the same price, like on eBay, for Linden dollars that is paid today on this huge exchange that trades like a million dollars a day. How interesting is that, right? It's interesting because it was the people and their productivity that essentially backed the currency, not its natural scarcity, as we see in crypto. So that's interesting. Some fun things that happen in Second Life that are just giggles for people thinking about building you know, new nation states, as is some of our conversation here. There was a huge tax revolt right in the beginning. I cooked up an idea where we would tax you little tiny amounts of Linden dollars as a function of how much stuff you had built on your land. My idea was that we'd regulate the resources a little better that way because, as I show you in the map, people could park right next to each other. They could own land next to each other, and so they'd tend to piss each other off with their behaviors if they put too much stuff on their land. And so I had this weird tax system uh, that would give you this weird tax bill at the end of every week, and people were so mad about that that they had a big Boston Tea Party and a huge revolt, and I'm always trying to find pictures of it because I can't, can't find any pictures on the internet of this thing, but it was just hilarious. People were mad at us, and we had to back down on that. 
Another one was um, land as monopoly. People, people that are doing like decentralized crypto worlds today talk about how owning virtual land as an NFT would be the best thing ever. That's totally not true, and here's why. Land is monopoly. If you, if you give total control over the contents of a piece of land to somebody that owns it, then what they do if they get mad at their neighbor is they just play loud music or put porn on walls on the edges of the land and set the land to have some artificially high price to force their neighbor to have to buy them out. Extortion, right? This is an example of how in system design, in world design, you have to strike a balance between like extreme centralization on one side and I guess crypto web three extreme decentralization on the other side. The stable place, the place where you find life or something like second life, is actually in the middle between these two. I think that's interesting too. Um, we had another funny thing that was called camping chairs. One of the other things, I th uh, there were these things called camping chairs. One of the other things we tried to do was motivate people. So we, we figured we were pretty smart designers and our big idea was wherever it is that people spend time in the world, whoever's property they go and hang out on, we should give those people more money. We should give them an incentive. Sounds like blockchain, right? We'll give them a financial incentive that will cause them to build cool stuff so that other people will come. And you know what happened? People reverse engineered how, much do how many dollars we were giving you per hour for sitting in this chair, and they'd set out chairs, like in the theater here, and they'd have a little sign on it that said, earn 10 cents an hour by just sitting in this chair as an avatar. The thing I always say is, financial incentives only ever generate financial outcomes. And that is a very serious statement for folks in crypto. So come back to me and challenge me on that. Um, the other thing about Second Life that's super, super hopeful is that just like the real world, and unlike social media, it tends to create connection between people, not polarization and separation. People in Second Life, by and large, and academics have studied this, don't believe me, are remarkably tolerant of each other, get along with each other, fall in love despite political differences or geographic or cultural differences. It's a remarkably peaceable, positive place. Why is that? Let me tell you a few of the reasons that I think apply to, uh, well, can apply to a lot of things. One is that we treat each other better when we're in the same room together, like right now. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that, and they're interesting, but one of them is just that if you literally see yourself occupying the same place in a world as somebody else, you naturally have a connection with them already. You're both in that same place. Think about how in Second Life or in a virtual world more generally, you're in third person view. So you're looking at somebody from behind, I'm sorry, you're looking at yourself from behind and you're seeing yourself in third person sitting next to them. That actually uh, enhances that feeling of being with someone even above what we do in the real world where we're stuck in first person view. Isn't that interesting? The other one of course is your avatar, uh, when, you, when you can reach out and touch somebody, your brain lights up with a sort of a map. It's called your peripersonal space. When somebody is within about 24 inches of you, you can feel them in your mind in a different way, right? That, again, causes you to be kind and considerate and thoughtful and, you know, all these things that we tend to not be online. So that's another thing that we learn from that. The other one is that Second Life, and this is the way the internet has to become, is pseudonymous, not anonymous. Again, a, a you know, debate for the crypto folks. Pseudonymous means that you have a real online identity, but that that identity has importance to you, so you don't want to lose it. So you don't want to piss people off in Second Life because they're going to kick you out of their environment, or they're going to stop being your friend, or they're going to stop doing business with you. And so you have something to risk in your engagements with people in Second Life in a way that, say, on Twitter, you don't. On Twitter, well, I mean, not everybody, you know, folks, my friends here, the people that have a real investment in Twitter, but if you're, if you're an angry listener on Twitter, you can just create a new account and come back and piss people off even more, right? But in Second Life, you can't do that because you're literally a person living in a community just like in the real world. Um, and, in, and more generally, the thing about Second Life is it demonstrates the way moderation needs to work and what's wrong with social media. Moderation, how we govern our behavior with each other, cannot be done entirely from the top down. Nobody likes that in the real world, you know, it's called authoritarian regimes, and nobody likes it in the internet world, which, you know, would be called something like Twitter, right? It's top down, one person makes the rules, and you all have to live by them. 
Instead, in Second Life, land and people dominate the control over moderation. So people organize themselves. Well, for, first of all, when you, when you, if, you, if you go into a bar and you piss people off in Second Life, guess who kicks you out? The bar owner. So the rules of that bar could be different than in another place, but if you piss that bar owner off, they're going to kick you out of their space and you can't come back. And as I said, you have this pseudonymous identity you're trying to protect. So it's important. So, uh, and, then, and then more broadly, people form groups in Second Life that own land together, and then they designate the rules of those groups. And those groups are recursively nested in other groups, and so on, and so on, until you get everybody you know, enclosed by the largest group. And so that bottom-up moderation, that decentralization of, of the rules of engagement, the social contract, the governance, works in the virtual world, and it should work we should use that both as a reference for other virtual worlds and also for here. Um, the biggest quote associated with me historically, even back, back in, which was from 2006, was, I'm not building a game, I'm building a new country. And of course, that's what many of us are here thinking about. What, if we are so lucky as to live in a near future where the confines of and the rules of traditional countries and governments and militaries perhaps bear less on us. What are we going to do? What a wonderful, delightful uh, question. You know, how are we going to build a world together? And I think many of these things I'm talking about um, are very relevant in that regard. I think the same idea of moderating our behavior through nested interlocking groups that we have the right to leave and that we can become belong to multiple of, such, of those groups. These are fundamental principles that we're seeing in some of the virtual worlds and that we can apply um, to the real world. Finally, what I'm working on uh, most recently is a, a plot goes back to that economy stuff. I'm actually working on a project now called Fair Share, which is an example of trying to apply some of these learnings to the real world. And Fair Share is a uh, is, is about to be um, an app, it's an alpha test right now on Discord, it's going to be an app that enables groups of people, probably locally or because of some affinity, to form groups for themselves and actually print um, their own digital currency, as I said earlier, backed by their own productivity and trust in each other. So completely different than the crypto uh, idea, but using uh, even crypto where appropriate to allow all of the different groups that form in that way to trade their currencies with each other. So that's actually what I'm working on right now. It's called Fair Share, and I'm looking for people to join me and, and work on it together. Um, and with that, I'm going to step to the side. I'm going to let's let's have some conversation. Oh, this won't come off. Ah, there we go. I got it. And I can't see you all, but now if I go like this. Oh, the light's following me. <laughs> or maybe dim the light a little bit so I can see everybody or bring the room lights up. So, yeah, we got a few minutes for questions. Yes. So you mentioned that um, uh, ownership of uh, digital assets by, uh, you know, would restrict um, the comfort and the kind of environment that, the, say, the neighbors use, the metaphor, uh, would experience in Second Life and in other places. But in most metaverses nowadays, uh, you, your property and your parcel and whatever you build on it doesn't have physical walls and there are no neighbors around you. How do you still see that being a problem in a place where you're isolated from the rest? Great question. So, yeah, are we going to live in worlds in which we each live in isolation or we each have our own domain, our own 40 acres or whatever, where we build whatever we want? I deeply believe that to not be true. So I think that these worlds in which you kind of control your own substantial uh, content domain, I, I believe from the experience I had in Second Life that they, they're not going to last very long. And the real reason for that gets back to the reason that we're not, uh, virtual worlds aren't growing right now, which is they have to be populated with lots of real people and we have to feel good communicating with each other face to face in those worlds. And that's why the Apple Vision Pro, that's why we're not using it. The Apple Vision Pro is a lonely experience. And even that very latest persona thing that they do, we all know is creepy and doesn't feel quite right yet. We have to get both nonverbal and facial communication information correct so that we can talk to each other. But the, 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 the long answer is we have to build together. 
There is no life for humans, and I think this applies more broadly to AI and everything we're doing right now. There is no life for us where we are not, uh, where love is not holding us together, where we are not collaborating as we historically did to build things together. And so we must build mechanisms that fundamentally enable that. And so, yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really, really, really interesting. Uh, um, you explained that, like, the currency uh, in Second Life is kind of backed by the people productivity or what the people produce in, in, in the environment, uh, in the virtual environment. Could you explain a little bit more this mechanism and how do you see, like, the how like the people contribution is creating is backing the the, the value of this currency? In, yeah, can you go just a little bit deeper into this mechanism? Imagine if all of us in Healdsburg, or, or everybody, or all of us here, imagine if suddenly you know, there was a great magic trick happened and there, the rest of the world was gone, and we were left to repopulate it, just us, uh, you know, starting here and spreading out from here and you know, creating new homes and creating new places to live and everything. What would we do about money? This is what I'm working on with fair share. So the way we would do it, let me promise you, like I, I, one of the things I always want to do at events like these, maybe we can sort of do that informally after this, is get a bunch of people together and say, what kind of money system could we all agree on? Having had that conversation a number of times and having uh, uh, delved, do I get a laugh on that? I am a living person. Having delved, delved into the, into the economics of how money works. The thing that works is the following. Um, you issue a constant amount of currency to everybody that's participating in the system, while at the same time using some kind of a tax, ideally a progressive one, because that helps, that keeps wealth inequality from the rich getting richer indefinitely. Uh, you fund a continuous income of currency for every participant, the same amount for everybody. You fund it with a tax. This is done essentially by the, the, the tax reduces the amount of money in supply, and the basic income gives money to everybody. And if those two things are voted on by a community and balance each other, then you have a stable currency. And then you basically have a circulating volume of currency. And what I meant when I said it's backed by people is, if we all have stuff that we offer to the rest of the world, and we make our own currency like we were a little country, that currency will have value even if it is unbacked. Why? Because the nominal person will come in and want to buy something from one of us. They will want to we, they will want to import what we are exporting, and they will then pay for the currency, and the price they will pay for the currency will be struck, if you will, by the collective value of all our efforts. And so if we're all like collectively almost worthless, then the value of our currency will be lower. If we're more valuable to the rest of the world, it'll be higher. This is just like a country. Indeed, what I think is about to happen with money is an experiment, a phase of exciting experimentation where there are going to be an enormous number of different currencies whose value is kind of struck in this way, which will then kind of trade with each other. So we're going to get this big, interesting settling process. We're not going to use a single currency for the whole world, except as a reserve or a settlement currency. But you would never export your own labor to get gold or Bitcoin. It makes no sense. If you, if you have a bunch of friends like we are, and you all agree, you can just create your own currency and start using it. You don't have to do work to get Bitcoin. Shall we have a last question? Yeah, um, you gave several anecdotes and, and stories about things that went bad, but um, sometimes you don't necessarily, um, like if you were to do it again, you would want those mistakes to happen again. I was just curious if you have regrets, like specifically regrets about Second Life and lessons learned where if you went back, you would do things differently. Well, I mean, at the level of the little things, my gosh, of course, there were so many, right? I, was, I started Second Life when I was, I was thinking I was 32 when I started it. I, I didn't know anything about building a virtual world. And so, of course, many of the decisions and things that we did were wrong, like the tax thing that I mentioned. I would do the taxes again, though, right? I wouldn't have given up on that debate. <laughs> I think at the time I was just so like, oh, my gosh, people are going to kill me. Um, so I think, but, but more broadly, let me give you a, a, a thing that I would have done differently. Um, I would have tried to build a more natural, organic, connected system environment and system of physics, laws of physics, because I've always had the strongest sense that we are about to create simulated worlds 
that those simulated worlds, just by the power of computers, are going to have kind of more data, more, more information theoretical stuff in them than the universe that we have easy access to does. So I think that going to Mars is probably not, I mean, as exciting a, a human adventure as that would be to set foot on Mars, I don't think that we gain very much by doing it. Um, furthermore, interstellar travel, as you know, if you're, my background is physics, interstellar travel sadly is not possible um, in, in all likelihood, uh, you know, maybe, maybe never. And therefore, it is by making worlds in, in inner space, by, by, by uh, as, as Richard Feynman said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. By exploiting the fact that the smallest bits of matter in the universe are fantastically small, by doing that, we're going to be able to create a world that living things emerge from and that the aliens that we're searching for in outer space are right there in the computer once we evolve them for a few billion simulated years and we can go hang out and talk to them. Um, I, I strongly believe that that's the future we're going to get to, so I guess maybe that's more of an exciting, you know, uh, last, last comment kind of a statement, but as a thing that I would do differently, I definitely had I to do it, had it to do, had I to do it over again now, I would go back and I would build something that was a liquid, organic physics, laws of physics world and, and get as much computing power, you know, I'd take Sam's seven trillion bucks and I'd spend it not on LLMs, but I would spend it on simulating reality and I would see what grew up there and you know, what I'd like to see before I die is I'd like to shake hands with one of those people because I mean that would really be something and I think that's, uh, if it's a good outcome, where we're going. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.